once you're in high the high seas, there really are not a whole lot of regulations. We're in no man's land at that point. Why aren't we helping people at that point? Like there's just there seems like a lot of nuance and a lot of discussion that needs to be happening between communities here because there really does seem to be a differentiation between the way that we treat people depending on what their bank accounts look like. Welcome to Millennial, the home of pretend adulting and real talk. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. And today we're going to have amazing help in discussing submersibles, submarines, whales, ocean exploration, and ocean conservation. Because today we're joined by Mackenzie Marguerite, better known on TikTok as Mackenzie. Get it? Mackenzie, Mackenzie, S E A. Mackenzie is a marine naturalist and scientist who uses her social media platforms to educate her audience on ocean conservation. And she also has firsthand experience working on submarines. And that's Ooh, one of many yeah. reasons why she's joining us today. Welcome, Mackenzie. Pew, pew, pew. Hi. <laughs> Hi. You're up in British Columbia? I am. I'm in Canada now. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. I would say us as filthy Americans, but you are American, right? So I am. Yeah. I try and pass as a Canadian, especially traveling abroad. They prefer the Canadians, you know? <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. imagine. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> So just to kick things off, what we're talking today about this submersible story and ocean conservation, but what's this experience for you in your role been like? And how many years have you been in it? Um, so I worked on a submarine for about two years. I worked for the company two years prior to that as well as their humpback whale naturalist. Um, so when the story originally broke, I think it was just like a moment of anxiety for anybody who's in the industry because you know what that's like. And I, I talked about on my TikTok how I I was in one very small emergency event. Like it was very small. It was nothing. Nobody got hurt. Nothing went wrong. It was just like this is something was happening wrong with the submarine and we took emergency procedures and we like the moment we saw our crew right the people that were in the submarine it was like this moment of whew I get to see I've seen my crew I'm feeling a little bit better right and so you I, you remember that anxiety that anxiety comes right to the surface again of that like moment of oh there's people on this submarine and so I think anybody who has experience in the industry really when the story broke had like a, a lot of empathy for one, um, because you know what that's like, you know what it's like to be in a submarine and to have these experiences and to be worried about your crew. Um, but then of course, like a moment of, of frustration, um, and, and that all the other things that come with it, right. It was a very complex feeling of, of yeah. scared, frustrated, angry a little bit. Right. Um, so mm -hmm. it was, it was definitely very complicated and it kept me up for sure. Just the idea of people being stuck in a submarine kept me up at night. Um, and people were like, I can't believe you would lose sleep over billionaires. If you've worked in a submarine, if you've been in it, then you would know maybe what it's felt, what it feels like. And that's all I have to say. Like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we'll get into that as, as this interview progresses more, because we wanted to get the perspective of somebody who's, who has had a lot of experience here. Um, but we found you on TikTok and you're pretty big on TikTok. Congratulations, first of all, but also you. <laughs> were you striving to grow or did it just like come naturally? You were just posting stuff you're passionate about and it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, no, I've, I've actually, I, I wanted to be a science communicator. That was something that I had wanted to do for a long time. Um, I loved being a naturalist and taking people on tours and seeing people who had like never seen the ocean before getting to connect with the ocean and me being like the catalyst for that. And there is nothing more empowering, more encouraging than seeing that, right? It gives you so much inspiration to keep moving forward, to keep fighting for the ocean. When you see someone's eyes light up that they've like never seen a whale before and they're losing it over a whale breathing, pff, best day ever, you know? Um, that so would be me. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that, right? I just, I love it so much and I love it so dearly. And um, so I had always wanted to be a science communicator. I'd always really been, uh, been interested in it. Um, and I had used my Instagram and, and other social media uh, platforms before to kind of like talk about ocean conservation and work on editing and that kind of stuff. And um, we ended up 
stuck in Canada when the pandemic broke out. And I remember the first TikTok that I made that I was like, since we're all sitting in our house together, let me teach you about coral reef. And it just stemmed from there. Um, so I, I did go in with the intention of teaching people about the ocean and teaching people about marine conservation. Did I expect it to like be a career? No, maybe not. <laughs> but I'm very thankful for it. <laughs> but with a name like Mackenzie, S-E-A, <laughs> you are destined for greatness, I feel. Thank you. <laughs> Well, we definitely want to talk about the ocean conservation side of your work in a little bit, a little later on in the interview. But I did want to ask related to the TikTok question, I'm sure you've seen and I know we've all seen um, a very sudden interest in submarines and submersibles happen as a result of this Titan story. What was it like for you to watch... um, you know, armchair researchers <laughs> suddenly become, quote, experts in submersibles and spread maybe some misinformation <laughs> on TikTok. Oh, my gosh. I'm laughing because I like right before I got on here, I posted a video that was responding to somebody doing something like this. Um, and I, <laughs> oh, like, and I was like, I know I'm just I know I'm just a dumb woman. Like, I know. I know it's so hard for you to like get information from some dumb woman. <laughs> they must have flirted my way through my degree. It's really hard. I know. I'm so sorry. Um, but like that's I think that was the big thing is that people like really really got into submarines, which I love that. I love the idea of people getting into deep sea. I love the idea that we are having all this energy into our planet and our planet's map and our planet's deep sea. That's really cool. Um, but people definitely took that like TikTok diploma and ran with it. They, um, you know, there's all of my comments are people just nitpicking things where they're like, you you didn't work on a submarine, you worked on a submersible. No, I understand where the confusion comes from. I understand that you like read some rules and you were like, these are the rules. The rules is the rules. (laughs) Most things in life, the rules are like a bit bendy, you know? There are a yeah, little, there's nuance. There's a little nuance to the rules. Just to clarify for anyone listening, is there a difference between submarine and submersible or are they interchangeable? Yes, there's a difference. Um, again, okay. the, the, the rules are a bit bendy. A lot of times we classify submersibles as something that is off like a mother vessel that has to be attached to a mother vessel, that a mother vessel needs to be there to dive, that like cannot be independent on its own. I worked on a submarine that had an escort boat and a mothership, still a submarine. Okay. You see how, and I, and I understand how that can be confusing. I understand how like the nuance can get a little funny, but like for us, our submarine was slow. The top speed is about four knots for anybody that doesn't have a reference point. That's like four and a half miles an hour. We are speed racers out there on the water, you know, vroom, vroom. <laughs> um, and we have about four nautical miles to get to our dive spot for, to bring people on board to go on a dive spot. So four nautical miles going four knots. A little math. It's going to take you a minute. Okay. Yeah. So we mm-hmm. tow the submarine mm-hmm. so that we can get to our dive spots in about an hour opposed to four hours. Right. Um, so there's reasons why we have an escort boat and a mothership and, and and something to go off of. I think it's like very much like how you approach any science subject where it's like you're first given a, a little batch of rules. And then when you get to like the next class, we're like, okay, so those rules, <laughs> we're going <gonna, we're laughs> to yeah. play with them a little bit here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, speaking of that, we wanted to also chat with you about the internets and, and kind of the globe's reaction to what happened with Titan I think we saw that there was this very quick movement towards being okay with making fun of the people who were on Titan. The narrative being there are billionaires who were ignoring any kind of safety regulations, building something that and and submerging in something that wasn't really able to be undergoing the mission that it was taking on. Um, So what a stupid thing to do. Let's make fun of them. What are your thoughts on that? I understand for one, like I, I I get it. I get why the jokes are coming. Um, Like I, again, I think it's a really tough situation. It's really hard to call. I think my biggest qualm and like what I like really 
am struggling with currently, like as we're still kind of unpacking the whole situation and learning about it. And like, there's more information coming out kind of on the daily, right? Like we're slowly starting to learn more. And what I'm having like a a major issue or, or qualm with is how things were framed at the very beginning of this incident. Um, how they kind of, they only told us that comms went out. They didn't really broadcast that their tracking went out, that they also had tracking. The tracking also went out at the same time comms went out. Tracking was completely independent from comms. It was an independent entity outside of the hall itself. So for both of those things to go out at the same time, there was other instances uh, there, you know, we now know from declassified military information that they did hear the implosion. There was just a lot of indications that said an implosion was the most likely scenario of what happened here. Um, do I think we should have still gone on, on a search and rescue mission? Of course. We need confirmation that people are not down there struggling. However, the jump that everybody took for five billionaires on a tube in the middle of the ocean is kind of hard to ignore, right? It's hard to rationalize how much money and effort and time and just everybody was instantly culminating to this area, right? From all over the world, we were sending vessels and millions and millions of dollars went into that, right? So that's what I am currently grappling with of of this whole situation. I think that like the the jokes can be a little bit mean, particularly for the family members. I think that's that's where my heart lies with, right? Like the people on board, they had no idea what happened. That happened so quickly that they had no idea that it even happened. Like, sure, we can be sad that they're gone, but they didn't suffer. They didn't have any idea that was that w- went on. It's their family members that I feel really bad for that have to see those jokes. And then, but I do, as I said, I do feel like there is a, a bit that we can talk about of how much money and how quickly we went into a search and rescue from everybody on board. The whole world came into this, right? With when we had evidence of a very, very unlikely scenario of them still being around. And that bill is being, we're we're not going to get like a, I don't think we're going to get an itemized receipt. Let's be real. I don't think we're going to have full transparency (laughs) of of where, of who's paying for, for what, but we do know that military was involved from both Canada and the United States. Military does get billed to taxpayers, you know? So there, I think there is a little bit of, of, of space for people to be frustrated and then, making jokes out of that frustration. And I feel like that frustration is is valid and real to an, a certain extent. Do I think we should be like really harming down on the people? And like, again, that's also like really low hanging fruit. Like you want to make low hanging yeah. fruit jokes that are also attached to it's, people that have died. People want to do it to feel yeah. better about themselves and move on. And look, I, I, I've been amused at some of the jokes. Yeah, I don't same. feel bad for the CEO. I feel bad for the kid. I feel bad for, in a way, for the researcher who, who's been down there a bunch of times. Um, but I, in terms of the money, I do think that's an important aspect that should be debated. But as somebody yeah. who's been out on the ocean countless times, is that fair yeah. to say? I mean, oh, yeah. it, there, there seems to be, from what I've been reading over the past week or two, there's been this um, kind of... I don't know what you want to call it, an unspoken rule, maybe for lack of a better phrase, that when somebody is in need of assistance out on the sea, other people like the Coast Guard will go to help them. That's just what they do. It's a public service. You you look out for each other. I assume you agree with that, but maybe your hang up is like how much money should be spent on this and how many resources should be diverted. Yeah, I like absolutely. Like the second that a second that somebody comes over your radio that they're in distress like you stop what you're doing. Doesn't matter who they are, what's happening. As as a seaman, you are stopping and you are and you are listening and you are seeing if you can help anytime, always. We know as nautical folks that what we're dealing with is a very temperamental environment. The ocean is not a consistent place. It is wild, wild west, right? And so we have a lot of respect for one another. We are we will always show up for one another. I think that also speaks a lot to the French explorer, what that was on board, the fact that so many, so much yeah. from like 
from the French military, you know, a lot of their resources came, spoke to him more than it spoke to anything else, right? Like, like there is some nuance in all of those as well, that like the, that was their crew member, right? That was their mate. They were coming, whether you liked it or not. Um, and that, and that is true, right? Like if, if it was one of my crew members in danger, I'd be the front of that boat, wet getting in there. And, and I know that. Um, but as I said, as you said, it's just how much, how much we were going and how far and, you know, there was, there was how many planes in the airs, helicopters, how many ROVs on the floor, they were shipping in boats from all over. And it's like, take a second to analyze what we're looking at. And how much we're willing to put into this. And you kind of, you know, you can see the difference of we have evidence of of awful things that are happening, like mis- missing and murdered indigenous folks in Canada. How much money goes into that? Mm-hmm. Not a whole lot. And we have a lot of evidence for how awful that is. So why is it that like you had evidence of a very unlikely, very, very, very unlikely situation of, of people being survivors and we put millions and millions and millions of dollars actively automatically into it, everybody from around the world, but you have thousands of people that are really suffering and we have lots of evidence for that. Mm, there seems to be no money going into that. So I think there can be a discussion about that. Obviously, I think that is not something that, again, I am really grappling with at the moment because as much as I am a seaman, as much as I want safety and everybody to be there. I also do understand that that can be, that that looks objectively awful. And as I said, I think that there was a way that they framed things to the media to know, to have that specific reaction, right? Like they didn't really talk about the tracking device. They didn't talk about the other things that they saw. They said, oh, the comms went out. We don't know. Hmm. And so everyone kind of grabbed on board, right? To come and help. So where where is the where's the line right of of how much evidence you have to supporting someone and how much money and resources we're going to put into that item that feels like that line is blurred depending on who you are and yeah that's an issue i think nothing illustrates that better than the fact that at around the same time this titan story was happening 700 refugees drowned and died and didn't really get very much coverage um, and certainly didn't have the same reaction on social media that this story did. I think there, I like the, when I think about that, think about that. I like, obviously that was like brought to my attention a lot. And when I know that the reason that 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 is the way that it is, is because we are so desensitized to the idea of like refugees being on boats, getting away from somewhere. We're like, that's a normal Tuesday. Whereas like billionaires in a tube at the bottom of the ocean is a little bit of an odd scenario. So like, that's why people like attach themselves to the story so quickly is it's like something new and novel. Whereas like refugees fleeing from a place and Titanic, of course. Yeah. And the Titanic. It's like this big thing. Yeah, exactly. So like, that's where it gets this, you know, big thing from. And so people really were like, let the other parts of these things go. And I think, again, that speaks to something off in the nautical community as well, that we were like so quick to jump on helping these five billionaires, but like there's a boat with 500 people on board that nobody was helping that supposedly people were like pushing away. Like, again, where are our priorities as seamen? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And once you're in high the high seas, there really are not a whole lot of regulations. We're in no man's land at that point. Why aren't we helping people at that point? Like, there's just, there seems like a lot of nuance than a lot of discussion that needs to be happening between communities here, because there really does seem to be a differentiation between the way that we treat people, depending on what their bank accounts look like. A hundred percent. That's a really good point. But um, something that you brought up that I think is interesting is just like the novelty of this being about billionaires. But if you strip down what happened with, say, the refugee boat recently and what happened with with the the billionaires going on this excursion, I think that like with refugees, usually people would say, well, that's a fool's errand. They should have known that it was really dangerous to traverse waters. Right. It's kind of the same thing with these billionaires, but they just like cut corners. Yeah. Right. So from what you've read or seen in regards to that, can you talk a little bit about where you think Ocean Gate went wrong? Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) I think I think the list is just broad strokes. Yeah. Yeah. Broad strokes (laughs) is totally fine. I think the list of like what they did right would be shorter. Oh, like it is. (laughs) That is a rough situation. Again, low hanging fruit. I don't want to be making 
ill jokes of people that have passed. That's that's not something that I'm here or would like to do. But like again, a very low hanging fruit just of how awful the design and things are that went into it, how little safety was considered. There's just so many, so many red flags. And at a certain point, you're like, okay, we're surrounded by, by red flags. Do we still get on the submersible? Like, do we, do we still do this? Um, because, like I, like it was from just the design of the Titan itself, from having a carbon fiber hull. If you've ever been on a surfboard that's carbon fiber or a canoe that's carbon fiber, you will know how wild of an idea that is. And the submersible community does not support that whatsoever, right? The submersible community had said, this is a carbon fiber, carbon fiber hull is not okay. You cannot do this. They were writing them letters. They were telling them, please stop. This is extremely dangerous. Carbon fiber very quickly will become like something that is, uh, will erode very quickly will become, um, dangerous. It, it, it it's not going to stay, uh, like titanium or something that, you know, we can dry dock every two years and ensure the more that you use carbon fiber, the more that you are diving with it, the, the worse it's going to get. And you can't exactly like fix that. And, you know, they ignored all of that. Um, the like remote control situation we do, like, I know military submarines utilize, uh, gaming controls or things like that. Um, I, I don't know if anybody's like flown a drone before, but you know, those like kind of drone gamer. Yeah. 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 I, I have one. They think I'm creepy for, for owning one. Go ahead. <laughs> No, you do. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, those are kind of sometimes they have similar th- devices to those. Yeah, like kind of joysticks and some yeah, buttons. Yeah, kind of joysticky. Yeah. And there is like reasonings for it. Like um, submarines, like the thing with submarines is that a lot of the times they are so different, like from model to model, from submarine to submarine is so vastly different that you really have to train on each submarine model to like know what you're doing. It's not like a car where you get like one license and you can drive all the submarines. No, you have to really be nuanced in each submarine. So like having these kind of joysticks or having these sort of like remote controls universalizes it a little bit. So that's kind of why they're moving in that direction to try and make things a little bit easier across the board. Um, But to have one joystick and one button, like I don't even know how you could control wireless. And wireless. Which means it's battery operated. Yeah. Like, I have no idea how you could control all of the things that you need to control with one remote control and a button. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't understand. <laughs> it, the video game point is very interesting. I, I read a similar point last week. These video game controllers have withstood the test of time. They're very well-designed controllers because they're meant to be comfortable in one's hand for extended periods. So like there's many benefits. It, so to a lot of people, it might be like video game controller. But yeah, like you were just saying, the militaries used them too. They just have more safety precautions in place, not just with the controller, of course, but I assume most controllers they use are wired there. Yes. And I've also never, I, I could be wrong, but I have never heard of a submarine being driven with a remote control <laughs> those submarines are like the remote controls are typically used to like utilize the periscope or to aim other devices to utilize the sonar like they're used for equipment pieces not for like driving the submarine <laughs> well to to that point about i think like part of the misinformation being spread was like as a result of the jokes people thinking that this submersible was being driven by a remote control maybe it was maybe it wasn't Um, But speaking of misinformation on social media, I was curious about whether you noticed an uptick in misinformation being spread on TikTok or even in the mainstream media and what you would say like the biggest point that people were missing really was from your own experience. I like can't think of anything that was like specifically like very wrong or misinformation. Like when the original story was breaking down, I remember that I was just like yelling at every article or yelling at every news outlet. I was like, what about the scrubbers? Like trying to like get any information about it. Um, Because everyone was talking about the scrubbers. Yeah. I was like, tell me about the scrubbers. Somebody fill me in. Um, Because everyone was just talking about oxygen, right? They were like, it has 96, 96 hours of oxygen left on board. And I was like, cool. What about the scrubbers? Anybody, anybody tell Mm. me about the scrubbers. Um, Because if any, for anybody who's not listening, or anybody who's not, sorry, anybody who doesn't know, anybody who's listening who doesn't know, my apologies. Um, 
you breathe out CO2, correct? If you're in a confined environment, you need to take that CO2 out of the air or you're going to build up the CO2 in your environment, which is not good. You don't want CO2 poisoning. Um, so that was my main concern, like kind of when the whole story was was coming out. Like that was the piece of like not misinformation, but like the piece of information that I feel like was missing more than anything, mm, right. you know, where yeah. I was like, I think that we need to like be having this conversation because from as the question that we just talked about, the design of the Titan it doesn't seem like they have a really great scrubber system on board or that they would, that would be able to last them those 96 hours. Um, so that was, that was more of the thing for me. Like I didn't think, I can't think of anything that was particularly like wrong that anybody was said again, maybe some things that like need a little bit of nuance that people were getting carried away with, but that was, there was pieces that I was like, it doesn't feel like a full puzzle. This feels like I'm getting little tiny pieces of a puzzle that I'm like trying to scrap together. That really isn't <laughs> making a whole lot of sense. Yeah. I'm imagining you, um, yelling at the news when they started having uh, the countdown. A lot of the news networks started including a countdown of the 96 (laughs) hours of oxygen. And I'm imagining you being like, if they don't have scrubbers, they don't got 96 hours. Yeah. No, I I was like, when someone told me that, they were like, it's this countdown. I was like, that can't be real. And I turned it on and I was like, what are we, what is this? Happy New Year? Are we really counting down people losing oxygen? It's like pretty that. crass. It's like appointment television. It is kind of crazy that that's where we're at, right? With sensational news. And that's one reason why the world was taken by the story, because there was that clear end point. At least we thought it was 96 hours. So there was that clear countdown. And maybe that was another reason, thinking a few minutes ago, back to what you were saying about, like, why did we put so many resources into it? We knew it, it was going to go for five days max. And then maybe the plan internally was we'll scale back after that. Something else I wanted to ask you about is one of the things you mentioned when we first reached out to you is that what happened last week proves there's a need for proper deep sea exploration. Getting past all these headlines about ocean gates. um, Can you talk a little bit about this and, and tell us why this is something more people should care about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think what we've seen right now, what we just were demonstrated, uh, is that the wealthy will do what they want. And there's not a whole lot that we are going to be able to be like, no, (laughs) no. Um, uh, So one of those things is that they already have been and are actively wanting to mine our deep seas for precious metals, things that go into like our technology, into our phones, into our computers. Um, that is something that companies have been actively already doing and trying to pass and trying to continue to do. Um, we as marine scientists have come forward and been like, hey, wait a second. We don't know nearly enough about our deep seas to do that in a way that would be sustainable or that we know would not interfere. Um, we already are causing a lot of irreparable damage to our oceans. Maybe we should like stop consider this one before we just move forward with it without having the proper information. And so I, it's my hope that this energy surrounding kind of the, the Titan and, and deep sea goes towards a want for further deep sea exploration that, um, maps and has our sea floors down to a much better understanding. Like we have a higher resolution map of our moon than we do of our own deep sea on our own oh, wow fucking planet wow. sorry excuse my french go on like, no, it's this fine is go off yeah. You're this is a planet. safe space like yeah. this is like the planet that you live on bro like the one that we're on right now like i know the ocean feels like it's really far away in concept but it's really like right here <laughs> like it's the reason that you breathe it's the reason that you're here and we don't have that mapped to nearly the same resolution we don't put nearly the same amount of funding or research into our deep seas into our own planet than we do Mars and the and outer space. Um, so I'm really hoping that this kind of energy picks up and has us redirected to that into, okay, let's, we need a deep, better understanding of our deep seas. We need a better understanding of our planet. Let's do that. Let's figure out how to do that safely, effectively, sustainably. Um, and then like, I don't, I don't support deep sea mining as it stands. I don't think that is like, like, you know, I think, Anybody who's in the ocean field, the second you say that, our automatic response is like, no way, man. Um, but as I said before, like 
telling billionaires no is not exactly easy, right? You can't just be like, no, <laughs> bad <Yeah>. billionaires. <laughs> well, and it, it's really hard to regulate that kind of thing, especially when you're talking about international waters. Yep. And That's like what I was right? thinking yep. too, like our high seas. Yeah. yeah. So like we're working on a high seas treaty and like that high seas treaty, um, like we have passed, but we need like a little bit more understanding of what that means for our deep seas and how, how we manage all of that. I think there just needs to be more funding, more research, more care put into our deep seas. And I really, really hope the energy goes into that. That's like my genuine, genuine hope. (laughs) Yeah. Thinking about individuals, thinking about all of us um, and just, you know, the average Joe among us, what are some things that anyone can do, big or small, to help with ocean conservation? Oh, I love this question. Um, I'm not a person who puts uh, individual, like individual efforts first. Um, And what I mean by that is like, I'm not going to be the person that's like telling you to recycle or like go vegan or like any of those things. If you do those things, Mm -hmm. that's cool. That's great. I I super commend you for it. If you have like the energy capacity to do those things, I think that's amazing and that you should. Um, Little actions like those can be influential. Um, However, my at what I've always stood by and what I've always like the hill that I will die on is that like collective effort is so much more impactful. Um, so like getting involved is so much more impactful and people get really overwhelmed by that. And I don't mean like you have to go and volunteer. I don't mean like you have to go out there, but even just like finding ocean advocates that you really like and like showing them your support and putting that out there can be astronomically helpful. Um, one of the big- biggest issues that we face right now in the conservation sphere is how like homogeneous it can really look, right? I was at a conference in early March and 90% of our speakers and the men and the people who are making decisions were men. Um, and of so course, oh yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> like they're, and this is 2023, right. And they're all, and like there's men making the decisions and we're like, and they do a lot of this, you know, kind of showing off of the women, right. Where they're like, look, we have a woman scientist, but then like the woman's there like doesn't really get to say much or decide anything and you're like okay like that is you're just showing me a woman to to be like we have one we promise (laughs) um (laughs) um, and that's like not really what we need right we need more equity in those spaces we need more diversity in those spaces um i i speak a lot a lot for the lgbtq plus community um just because we have been really like ostracized particularly in the last few years there's been a lot of like dehumanization of the lgbtq plus community which in spaces like that can be really dangerous because you're making policy changes that are going to affect people's lives if you're making those policy changes and queer people or other marginalized groups aren't considered in that policy change that's that's not going to be very great, right? Um, so mm. showing support, what I tell people to do is um, this, like this past year, I made it onto uh, peak action and Harvard's uh, list of like 23 climate creators to follow. So there's 23 of us. There's a list from last year as well. And my recommendation is to go look at that list and like find people that you register with that like have a bit of your identity, like, you know, and, and they're, you're not going to find one person that encompasses all of who you are. That's just not possible, but you can kind of take that, take the big pieces of your identity, break them down and, and, and follow people that kind of encompass that. Right. And then when you follow those people, when you support those people, when you're giving them, um, a bigger platform to stand on, you're then getting those people in the room to make those decisions. You are, so now you're, you know, who you are is now being represented in that room. And that is big. That's what we need right now. So like even just showing support on social media, when you're scrolling, you know, stop at one of the, one of those ocean advocates or one of the climate advocates, stop, listen to one of their videos, show support, give a little comment. Like it doesn't have to be something that you over like overwhelm your mind with, right? It doesn't have to be something that takes over your life. It can be something as small as showing somebody else that energy and helping them get into that space. Um, so that's what I say. Collective issue, collective effort is a big one. Of course, get involved in your uh, local like nonprofits if you can. Learn who your local representatives are and what they stand for is a, probably a really big one. I think people don't realize sometimes that they're like, oh, I live in a really progressive place. Do you? Do you? Look it up. Yeah. Do you? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so things like that, I think, are way more impactful um, than like recycle. <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. 
No, yeah. that's that's super helpful. And we'll definitely include a link to that list as well as links to your social channels in our show notes. Um, but are there any any other resources that you would want to point people towards if they're thinking about how can I contribute to this collective effort um, of ocean conservation? Any organizations um, or... Yeah, there's definitely some really cool organizations out there. I say if you were really interested in what I talked about as far as like deep sea, um, the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, uh, I was one of their young ocean leaders for this year. And they are a huge, huge voice in the like, defend the deep, um, stop ocean mining, you know, campaign, they have a huge voice in that. Um, So they're a really great organization. They support a lot of like, young people. And they also support a lot of um, young initiatives. So if you have something in mind, where you're like, this is a marine conservation issue, that's like really dear to me, you might be able to like find a young person that's like coming up with a really innovative solution to that. That's kind of what they support. So that's one of my big ones is Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Um, uh, I would say the ocean culture st- life, they also have a lot of storytellers. I think that's a big thing that I try and um, uh, get people to go t- towards is like storytellers. You know, I'm a scientist and I say a lot of things in like a very matter of fact, fact way, sometimes a bit cold that people like don't really register with it as much as I like inspire through education. And I know people do find connection to the ocean through what I teach them. I also know that like some people like stories and empathy and like to be connected to it in a very like emotional way. And I don't provide that necessarily. That's not, you know, I'm just teaching you. I'm not necessarily like giving you that emotional connection, but there are storytellers out there. So ocean culture life supports a lot of storytellers. So if that's, if that's something that you connect with more, if you connect through art or through those more medias better, then that may be something that you want to check out um, and find your find your connection through there. Um, I think just the best thing to do is if you want to get into that is to like find the thing that like would keep you going, right? Like find your favorite. What's your favorite sea creature? Orca whales. Ooh. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Fight for the orcas, you know? Yes. Yeah. You know, figure it out. Like, no, what, I, what, I, I think that's a great point. Like, what are you passionate about? And yeah. Stick with that. Stay in yeah, the like, lane yeah. and that'll help you stay focused mm-hmm. and on yeah. the ball. Yeah. Like what, you know, what yeah. makes you want to keep fighting and then like learn and then, and that's, and that will keep you going. Um, like I always say, like, you're, you're going to fight for the thing that you love. Right. So like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to convince you to come to the ocean rally unless you love the ocean. So like go fall in love with the ocean. And if this was like inspiring to you, go do a little research. That's what I try and do is I try and introduce people to sea creatures so they can be like, ooh, I found my new, my new hyperfixation. And I'm like, good. Hyperfixate on it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget it. Don't forget yeah. the passion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I actually did want to ask you about orca whales really quick. Are they coming to kill us all? Can you confirm or deny? <laughs> Have you spoken with them? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm so team whale for one. Um, Heck yeah. always have been, always will be, you know, like, uh, I know that they're like doing damage and that they're damaging boats, but they're not killing yeah. people. They're just like, yeah, fuck you and your boat. Um, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. honestly, <laughs> fair. And they're like, fuck you, billionaire, right? Yeah. And that's something we can all <laughs> like, agree on. I can't exactly like be mad at them, you know, like there, yeah, there's like yeah. evidence that like the main, the main one who had, who has been teaching it all, like had a, a collision. And so now she's angry. Like, you know, <laughs> can I be that I, mad about a, that? Like, yeah. It's a fascinating yeah. story. And, um, um it's, but no, I, I do love the story. I think it is so funny. I think <laughs> that it's um, something that we're going to definitely continue to talk about uh, for years to come of like the orcas attacking us. Um, but but <laughs> just to like anybody who's afraid of the ocean, just to like leave, like alleviate some stress of anything. We have no records of any orca ever attacking a person in the wild ever. Of course, orcas oh. in captivity are a different oh, okay. story. Orcas in captivity. Yeah may have Mm. lost their minds um rightfully so but we have not a single record of an orca attacking a person in the wild ever um they have obviously attacked boats and have obviously caused damage but they are not going after people they are highly intelligent they know what they're doing um yeah i love them all right i i thought that you would like this little orca fact though since we're in a not pg show did you know that the southern resident killer whales, which are the pod, like there's different populations of orcas all over the world. Um, we might even be subcategorizing, subspecying orcas in the next, you know, several years. Um, but the southern resident killer whales, um, when they're young, the boys will go off together 
for a little boy party. Oh. Together. Wow. Together. Good for them. It's a little wow. group, yeah. group activity. This explains so much. You know, I, I'm gay, Mackenzie, <laughs> and I was really into Free Willy as a kid, the movie. Yeah. And this is starting to, the puzzle pieces are starting to fit together, I think. <laughs> together? Well, happy Pride, Andrew. Yeah, happy Pride. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for oh, sharing that. And You're that's welcome. a good reminder, too. I, You know, I didn't know that about the whale, uh, orca whales not um, attacking any humans out in the wild. But we just, we kind of just assume that just because it's happened at SeaWorld. Yeah. So that's, that's a that's good true. point. Never in the wild, just in SeaWorld. And like, again. How much can you like really blame blame them? No, of course, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's it's not like they um ended up in Sea World through non nefarious <laughs> means, <own> choice. right? <laughs> like, right? <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. The the first ever like orca that we put into captivity, we harpooned and then put it in captivity. Yeah, mm. that Ugh. seems nice. Yeah, I don't I don't blame them for being pissed. Honestly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, Mackenzie, this has been so awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Your M C K E N S E A on yes. TikTok. Anything yes. else you want to plug? Uh, same thing on Instagram. There's a little underscore in front of it because somebody stole my name on Instagram, which rude. Okay. Oh um, no. <laughs> I know. I've I've been fighting with Instagram for them to give it to me. Um, but yeah, there's an underscore in front of it. But same name on Instagram. Um, and yeah, you can any questions that you guys have, I I answer a lot of questions on social media. So if you are heard anything that you're like, I have questions about that, come ask me. I will happily, happily answer for you. Um I also I do run a little like a little group that's called LGBTQ in STEM. So anybody that has uh, would like to see some representation for LGBTQ plus folks in STEM, we do have a little group on on uh, Instagram. I have created scholarships before for LGBTQ plus folks in STEM, and we do a lot of representation, just a lot of like opportunities and networking and stuff like that. So that's another thing that you can come check out. Yeah. Cool. That's Man. incredible. Yeah. That's we'll fabulous. include Thank links you. to all those things in our show notes mm -hmm. as well. Well, thank you again, Mackenzie. This has been great. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm glad you guys enjoyed. All right, listeners, definitely check out all of Mackenzie's work online. I'm going to go check out... Never mind. I don't like that. I was going to take it to Gay Orca Whales. <laughs> <laughs> you were yes, like, I love gonna... that out of everything, that's what you took away from this interview <laughs> is Gay Orca Whales. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's the ad break. It's fine. <laughs> I'm going to go have a hot Orca Boy summer. All right, I'm back from Only Whales. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> That's actually, a great tease for our next show, honestly. It is. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to ask our next guest about Only Whales. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that's a market you can fill. <laughs> only orcas. Uh, only orcas. Mm. <laughs> so we wanted to kind of extend this conversation today by talking about extreme tourism in general and then tragedy tourism. In light of this story, obviously, it's it's one of the stories of the year. And I thought it'd be interesting to look at other examples of extreme tourism. And there were a couple of reports highlighting some more extreme things that primarily rich people can do. So let's just review these, see if there's any that we would like to do. Swimming with a great white shark in Mexico. You're in a cage, but I guess they can swim right up to you. No, I don't think I would do this. Yeah. Mm -mm. No, no. Mm -hmm. it just seemed like if that goes wrong, it goes really wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, all of these end <laughs> with that possibility. Uh, sailing by an active volcano in New Zealand. I would do this. I would do this, too. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you why. If some fire lands on your head, you're in a freaking boat. Just jump into the water and kill it. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know. And you're just sailing right by, you know, yeah. like like with the ocean gate, you're going down for 12 hours. There's a lot of time for something bad to happen. I feel like sailing by, I, I guess you stop for a couple of minutes and enjoy the view, but then you just keep going. I've actually stayed in a hotel by an active volcano. Um, I stayed in the um, it's actually uh, the former National Geographic Observatory at uh, the Arenal volcano in 
volcano in Costa Rica. Um, and because it's the former um, Nat Geo Observatory, it's the hotel that's the closest to the base of the volcano. And you have, you know, depending on where in the hotel you are, you have a patio that you can walk outside and the volcano is just there and you can just see it. Um, and it is an active volcano that, of course, goes dormant sometimes. But we were definitely hanging out in the pool and like watching the volcano. It wasn't erupting, but it was like rumbling and you could see the embers coming out of the top. It wasn't like, like actively, oh, 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 oh. there were no active lava flows or anything like that, but it was Help. fascinating to see. And that's a great example of something that you can do that isn't going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's just, it's a hotel. Did you say how far mm-hmm. away you were exactly? <sighs> like a couple miles. Uh, okay. Did they like? It's the closest you, you can get to the volcano. When you check in, do they like give you emergency instructions just in case? No. Okay. <laughs> you're on so your just own. Like kid. Run no. for your life. <laughs> if you were dumb enough to come out to this volcano, you're on your no, own. No, I think it's because. Um, you know, they have scientists monitoring active volcanoes all the time. And okay. if there's about to be a massive volcanic event, they would probably just shut operations down and not let anybody stay there. I mean, of course, Costa Rica is, you know, it's on the Pacific Rim. So you do have a lot of earthquakes in that part of the world. So there's always a possibility of something unexpected happening, but they do there's- monitor it. Um, and man, that I would say as like a bonus recommendation, if you ever go to Costa Rica and you want to do something like that, I highly recommend staying there. Um, that hotel is, it feels like a nature retreat. When you go to stay there, that's where you are and you're not really going to be going you're not going to be in a city or near a big city or anything like that. And there's all kinds of like hiking trails and rainforest and waterfalls. It's gorgeous. Anyway. So there's no like volcano alarm in the room, like a fire alarm. It sounds like there kind of should be. I mean, if you're midway through your trip. I'm thinking. <laughs> I will say, though, when the volcano is active, it sounds like it's thundering. Like there was uh-huh. uh, one time where my mom and my brother came to visit and we stayed there. My dad stayed there with me on a separate trip too. And on both occasions, we heard this like rumbling outside and we thought it was thundering. It wasn't, it was the volcano. Okay. $750,000 trips to the deepest known point in the ocean. No, nope. The Mariana trenches challenger deep, seven miles deep. I think after no. what, what we've we seen in the last just... couple of weeks. And, you know, Mackenzie touched on a point that I think is really scary about the ocean. There's so much that we don't know about the ocean. So it was actually a thought that I had when we were watching season two of Prehistoric Planet. And they were covering some of the deep sea aquatic dinosaurs that were down there. We know so little about the deep sea and what lives there how we have no way of proving that some of those species don't still exist. Mm. You know what I mean? That shit's yeah. scary. I I want to admire it from afar. I want to watch yeah. lots of documentaries. I don't want to go there. Yeah. And maybe, you know, we're always worried about aliens. Maybe they're living down there. They come down from the sky and that's where they are. That is a theory. Is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> how about, so on the flip side of the deepest depths of earth mount everest there is a two hundred thousand dollar package for a three-week trip that gives you an expert traveling with you so that's good but i still don't think i would go that's still too scary the whole oxygen thing no and also you just the level of physical fitness and readiness that you need to have to be able to do this is I think something a lot of people don't understand. So many people die trying to summit Everest. It's just not worth it. Um, I will say, even though I would never do it, I am fascinated by it. When I was a kid growing up, my dad went through a phase where he was very fascinated by people who had tried to summit Everest. And he was listening to a lot of audiobooks of memoirs and firsthand accounts of people who 
had tried to summit the mountain and spoiler alert, like they're never really pleasant memoirs. Um, it's a grueling process, even if you make it start to finish without, you know, any death or anything. (laughs) Um, but it is wild. And I just wanted us to, for a second, uh, talk about the fact that the frozen dead bodies of adventurers who died on Everest are still there because it's too expensive to take them down. And they're used as landmarks today. That's yeah. disturbing. Like, it'll literally be like, yeah, you get, there's this one really famous one called Green Boots. And it's this guy who's just like in the fetal position in the snow wearing green boots. And they're like, yeah, like, Go left when you get to green boots. Like they're just landmarks Ugh. at this point. To, to your to your point about your dad being obsessed with Everest when you were a kid, I distinctly remember, and I don't know if you all have this uh, recollection too. Um, like a lot of kids that went to school with me, going through a phase where they were reading Into Thin Air which is a memoir about scaling Everest. And I'm not sure when that came out, but I know it had a really big moment in like the nineties and the early two thousands. So I think that like uh, oftentimes stuff like that, like things of pop culture significance create a a spike in interest for sure. Mm -hmm. All of these types of destinations. So Pam, you wouldn't do Everest. I take it. Definitely not. But like Laura, <laughs> it's because I, I know that I'm not physically fit enough to do Everest. And I know that a lot of people cut corners because if you have enough money, you can pay to kind of um, have whoever is in charge of giving the OK gloss over whether or not you're physically fit enough to do oh. the track. And I think that that's the reason why you're starting to see more fatalities, too, when it comes to scaling Everest. I guess if there's one good thing about the bodies, it's that it might keep you a little humble. Like, oh, shit, this really does happen out here. Yeah. And some of those bodies have been there for like decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just perfectly preserved. So another one I wanted to talk about, this one's pretty unique and there's no specific location, but I saw this in the in an article from Insider. They're called Get Lost Packages by a travel company called Black Tomato. For up to 100 grand, these people will design a get lost package for you. It looks like in most locations on Earth, very remote locations, of course, and you tell them how lost you want to get, and then they come up with this package, but they're tracking you the whole time via satellite phone. So it is safe, to an extent, I suppose. And they encourage you not to bring your real phone so that you can truly become disconnected, but still have a vital connection in case you need it. I like these. Now, this is way too expensive. Packages can start at $15,000 for a few days. Still way too expensive. But actually, I mean, I don't know. Some grand vacations uh, that people do pretty commonly, I guess, can run up to fifteen grand. I don't know if that'd be 15 grand for a single person or what, but I I think I would do this. I'd love to be disconnected for a little while. And as long as I had that satellite phone and as long as they weren't throwing me somewhere dangerous, I think it's okay. Why don't you just hike the Pacific Crest Trail and call it a day? Get lost by yourself. Yeah. 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 I mean, like, at least then you there are are markers. I I don't know. I, I know that, Andrew, you do hikes at national parks and stuff like that. Sometimes I go hiking too on local trails and there's different trails that you can take, right? But even on in places that I I'm familiar with, I still kind of get a little nervous taking um trails that I've I've never traversed before because you never really know what's going to happen and sometimes too like depending on the time of year, like I've been um on specific trails um up on the the mountain near me and you'll get to a certain point and they'll say like, oh, sorry, just kidding. This trail's closed. You have to turn around. Oh, yeah. So, you know, like you're it's always like there's always like some kind of risk involved. I feel like there's enough risk that I don't need to like go seeking thrills by having someone like purposefully lose me. (laughs) That's true. I should add just to make people aware with the latest iPhones. And I think Andrew is starting to do this, too. They now the phones now have satellite connectivity and 
<laughs> Did you like how I just pronounced that? Connectivity. Connectivity. <laughs> Connectivity. I wanted to sound fancy. Um, so now when you don't have a, a cell signal, it'll switch to the satellite mode. And if you, it'll direct you how to point the phone up into the sky and you will be able to send short text messages to emergency services. For now, this is free. Apple is going to eventually start charging in the next couple of years. And then one other safety point for people like Pam, um, if you have an Apple watch, when you start a hike, Coming with the new uh, watch OS, this is going to get easier. When you start a hike, it is keeping track of your GPS coordinates. And if you get lost, there's a little retrace, retrace your steps button. And it'll walk you back the way you went. That is brilliant. That That's is really cool. nice. Because sometimes you you miss a... I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but like I've definitely missed a trail marker before. Oh, yeah. And I've had to like go back yeah. and and be like wait where where did i come from because i've been walking a little too long and i haven't seen any yeah other signage so and they're also going to start showing you the last place you had a cell signal so apple's been really thoughtful when it comes to people who are hiking in remote areas all right so that's black tomato uh pam basically just uh told me not to spend money on that that's fine that makes sense I'm saving you money you can spend elsewhere. Yeah, <laughs> just, just on a fancier Apple Watch, <laughs> and, or just give it to me and Laura. You yeah, know? <laughs> seriously. For what? A cruise? We'll, we'll get you. We'll get you lost for a hundred k. Seriously, kidnap just me and dump me somewhere. <laughs> yeah, turn on. Make sure you know your Find My iPhone is on, and then just go with the honor system. Say you're going to keep your phone on you, but you're not going to check it. You're not going to use it, <laughs> right? Because you're paying for this experience. So, you know, it's kind of up to you to um, not use the phone. And then me and Pam profit. I think this sounds <laughs> like, yeah, we, we dump Andrew in the ocean <laughs> to go find the, uh, the, the orca, the orca pod, or the gay orca pod. Yeah. <laughs> 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 orca uh, boys town that sounds fun yeah orca boys town <laughs> how about so have we done any extreme tourism here i laura has a couple things in here i don't know if these count i love you but you I don't, don't think they parasailing count. counts mm, extreme i mean yeah. it's like 700 feet in the air yeah you have a light like, vest on right yeah, but I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like if you fell from 700 feet, having a life vest doesn't matter. I you got you... a parachute, too. <laughs> yeah, but if, if you fell from the parachute. <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding. Um, I mean, I was 11 when I did it. Does that count? Oh, that does seem more dangerous for an 11-year-old. Yeah, I was 11. Parents signed off and everything. Yeah. Yeah. You know what we did? Uh, we did parasailing one time too, my brother and I, and I think it was in Cancun. And my my mom signed off like it was there was not a care in the world. It's one of those so, things you see so many people doing it. It must be fine. Yeah, yeah. Until it isn't. Um, <laughs> I've also done one of those slingshot things, you know, where they strap you in and then they release <laughs> yeah. you. Blah. Uh, there's there is a fun video somewhere of me on that thing screaming my fucking head off. I'll have to see if I can find it. Um, and I've also done zip lining a few times. I think that the more extreme one that I did was when I was living in Costa Rica. I went zip lining in the rainforest, which was yeah. that's a very big cool. tourism attraction in Costa Rica. Oh right? yeah, yeah. You and I did. Do a you little know of any like? Is there are there any accidents that happen like regularly? Do you know? Not that I've heard of. I'm sure they do because, um, you know, I'm sure there are some companies that do it. that are more reputable than others. Um, but I had a great experience. I went on the one that actually has one of the it has like the longest um, line in the country. And it's a whole course. So there's like a dozen or so lines that you're walking through the forest to get to and kind of do one at a time. But the very last one goes over this enormous valley and kind of ends you back in the trees. It was very cool. According to a quick Google, between 2006 and 2016, there were 16 reported zip line fatalities in the U.S. That's, that's just the U.S. That bad. No, it's not bad. Oh, that's, that's actually not bad. Still, yeah. yeah. I wonder if any I of like them happened odds. 
at the one that we went to, Andrew. Yeah, we went at the tail end of that date range. We went in 2016, right before Trump was elected. <sighs> I yeah, know. I, I felt safe. I mean, you have so much safety equipment on. Yeah. Yeah, that one was legit. You you were like double locked in at all yeah. times. Yeah. Had all that stuff up in my junk. I'm a crotch. <laughs> it was very <laughs> uncomfortable, but I was safe. <laughs> and that's what matters. How about tragedy tourism? And we wanted to talk about this because people wanted to visit the Titanic because it's the Titanic, this massive tragedy. I, I, I can't decide if it's messed up. Or, or worth it. Like from a historical perspective, yes, makes a lot of mm-hmm. sense to go. But on the other hand, it feels like a place taking the Titanic as an example that maybe shouldn't be disturbed for several reasons. But then you look at a place like the 9-11 Memorial, which I think we all here have visited mm-hmm. in yeah. lower Manhattan. And it, I, I guess it depends on the job they do kind of creating a memorial. But like in the case of the 9-11 memorial, that was very tastefully done. The infinity fountains. Yeah. I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think that like, I think part of it is that with something like 9-11, that's recent history for us. So it feels kind of weird to see people say like taking pictures being there. Right. Because that that's a, a significant point in history that we all remember. Whereas in contrast, like I didn't bat an eyelash. Um, like I think I like asked my mom if we could go to the Ford Theater, for example, where Lincoln was shot. That's technically tragedy tourism, but because you know it was interested in history, it was like, oh, this is fascinating because you're far enough removed, right? And I think that that, that's maybe where the disconnect lies in a lot of this. Yeah. And I think some of it, too, kind of depends on what the reasoning is. You know, and I think when you think about, like, the 9-11 Museum, or even, I just want to point out our social media manager, Chloe, is bringing up going to sites like Auschwitz. It's We had that in the... We discussed that, too, actually. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's, um, It's to not forget the history of what happened. I think presumably Mm -hmm. it's this was this horrible thing that happened. And we remember this place because we never want it to happen again. Um, So I think there's a difference between that motivation and maybe the more macabre motivations Not to say that the macabre ones are bad because I do the same thing, Pam, like what you were discussing. I love going to do things like that, you know, above, you know, on land. I'm not interested in going in the ocean to do it. Um, Yeah. But I, I think there's, there's remembrance and then there's morbid curiosity. And I think maybe yeah. that's where we start getting into some of the differences Mm-hmm. To that point, I know that there are definitely, like, for example, the visiting the catacombs is very hokey, right? Mm-hmm. Or like you can take a whole tour of Jack the Ripper when you go to London. And yeah, it, because like those are kind of things that are kind of steep, steeped in, enough in mythology that it becomes macabre to your point. Um, I, I think it's hard to like really put into perspective what it must have been like to have been like living during that time and perhaps fearing that you would be the next victim of Jack the Ripper, for example. But but like, you know, because we were alive during 9-11, for example, and as we got we you get older, I think that like the um the significance of that hits you harder. Or like for someone like Andrew who grew up in the shadows of like New York city, right? Like that, that experience was like way different than like somebody like me who grew up clear across the country, maybe could not comprehend as much. Yeah. And I think it can be a humbling experience. It can be obviously a very educational experience. That's probably the number one benefit of Mm -hmm. getting yourself involved in tragedy tourism on a note related to the nine 11 Memorial. There's also a Flight 93 memorial. That was the plane um, that you know the passengers on board tried to take control of it. It crashed in kind of 
eastern Pennsylvania. And the memorial's in the middle of nowhere where the crash actually occurred. I have driven by it so many times because when I was living in Chicago temporarily, I was going back and forth between there and New Jersey, and it was right off that freeway. I never actually stopped, but I always saw the signs. And I'd be curious to see that just to see the work they did in putting together a tribute. I And I think yeah. that's probably a driving factor for a lot of people, too. Like, how are how's the state how's the 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 country paying tribute to this horrible thing that occurred um and i think you know to some extent people want to be where things happen they want to be there and be like damn it happened here this is unbelievable you know and it can maybe give you a in some cases depending on your relationship with these tragedies um it could be a life life life-altering experience yeah, it's it's a solemn pilgrimage, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, I love that Pam that you brought up the Jack the Ripper tours because nobody's solemn on a Jack the Ripper tour, right? Just like <laughs> right. nobody's solemn <laughs> on a, on any kind of ghost tour that they go on, right? Myself included. I've done so many of those and they're a ton of fun, mm-hmm. but the reality is, is they're based on real people who died. So there is sadness to it, but I think when it's more of um when it's a sm- I think a smaller impact and it's far enough in the past it's easier to start um viewing that as more more entertainment and less sad. Yeah. A really good example of that too like is um uh Culloden Moor in Scotland has been like overrun by tourism as a result of Outlander, which obviously a very popular book series, but also now a hit series on stars. And people now, if they're familiar with Outlander, are going there because of a fictional story that happens to um, have that as a focal point, right? Far early on in the series. And there's really no regard for the fact that like, it's a real site of like real catastrophic debt, death. And so like, that is interesting too, right? Is like how, um, you know, again, how, how pop culture shapes how we process and how we, um, for lack of a better word, enjoy these sites of cultural significance. Laura, you you were transitioning really nicely into this point, actually. The Titanic. We know you're a Titanic girly. Um, we know you're in love with your boyfriend, Mark. Let me pitch you this idea. Okay. <laughs> so there's a Titanic exhibition here in Vegas. And I learned in doing research for today's episode that this Titanic exhibit offers wedding packages. Oh. For $3,000, you can get married in a recreation of the Grand Staircase. Okay. So I have some questions. This is in Vegas. Um, Yes. Is the recreation of the Grand Staircase going to come complete with... Um, an Elvis impersonator to uh, be our officiant? Um, I don't think so, but I can dress up as Elvis if you want. Oh, shit. Or we can okay. find an Elvis in a billion other places in Vegas. This is at the <laughs> Mandalay Bay. Oh, no, sorry. The Luxor Hotel, by the way. Um, you can bring up to 12 people, but that includes you and Mark. So you're down to 10. I mean, that's fine. I don't have that many friends, so... <laughs> <laughs> standing room only no seats they're not giving oh. you any seats this is just like the titan no seats <laughs> presumably and, bigger than the titan though yes yes hopefully roomier it includes private access through exhibits for wedding guests too so that's <laughs> that's a nice touch but okay. yeah 10 a.m seven days a week three thousand bucks you can get married in a recreation of the grand staircase what do you think 
I mean, it it's very tempting. I would mm-hmm. need to see pictures. I'm curious to know what the level of authenticity is. Again, it's Vegas. So is it like the grand staircase plus uh, some slot machines and flashing <laughs> lights in the background? Like, I'm really yeah. curious to know what the aesthetic is going to be. You know, I, I have also heard like not to dissuade you from getting hitched in Vegas, because obviously, you know, that has its straws. But uh, I know that the Titanic exhibit in Tennessee, which is a little bit closer to you, Mark, also has a recreation of the Grand Staircase. So here we go. Which Titanic exhibit would you choose? That's the real <laughs> question. We'll have to do some price comparisons. <laughs> well, this That's one's fair. I'll tell you this. It's got a 4.6 out of five star average on Google Maps. I think that's pretty good. Oh, People seem to be okay. happy with this exhibit. Ex- Exhibition. It's been there a while, and I what dropped does? the link. The staircase what looks nice. Is this? It does look what, good. What Luxor. casino is this in? Oh, the pyramid. Okay, in the Luxor. Okay. <laughs> of course. <it's laughs> There's a... nothing there anymore. Like they need to fill the space. That's the place, of course. Uh, my yeah. my my story I tell all the time with um, Emerson. Oh, about not... the pizza. Yeah. Oh, after oh. party at the Sabaro. <laughs> That's where you can have the reception at the Sabaro where everyone can buy me a slice of pizza. <laughs> you, you Wait can buy a Andrew second. a slice of pizza and, and uh, so you they know, have the ache in his heart. They have the grand staircase <laughs> set up, but they don't have like the grand dining room or like the cafe Parisian or anything like that from the Titanic <laughs> that I could have my reception in. Like I want the full experience, including a flood. Let us all out of the end when it's time to go. <laughs> you you want to hold on to Mark's hand and say, I'll never let go. <laughs> I mean, we can throw I you in the Bellagio Fountain cold. Lake where you can uh, recreate the door scene. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Get can me very believe? drunk first and I'll do you it. You can prove that both of you could fit on the door. Oh, <laughs> man. We can finally prove the theory. Yes. <laughs> can you believe? I, I was it. just thinking about this. <laughs> The Titanic, <laughs> a legendary story, horrible tragedy. What did I say? 350 real artifacts from the Titanic are in this exhibit. They're sitting like 300 feet from shitty slices of pizza at the Sabaro. <laughs> Those poor artifacts. They deserve so much better. <laughs> I know it is. It is a really <laughs> oh weird mind fuck to think about something that feels so removed from time that is like a remnant of a tragedy it, coming from two and a half miles from the bottom of the ocean. This sitting beautiful next to fine fucking China. <laughs> oh, it's so sad. I'm going to go to the Luxor to mall, mall, mall pizza. Man. <laughs> I've been through here a bunch of times. It, they're close. They really are close to one another. Too. I think that you need to, for the show, I think you need to go to this Titanic exhibit. I mean, yeah. I'll definitely go to the exhibit for sure. I <laughs> okay. mean, as, as y'all said, I am a Titanic girly. Andrew, this is on the list for when we all finally get together in Vegas. I really want to go. I would okay. love to do this with you because I have gone to a Titanic exhibit, but it was when I was like 10 years old. So it's been a while. Yeah. Okay. Oh my God. Let's do it. Let's make they it a Patreon a- goal. We'll go to the Patreon. Titanic exhibit in Vegas. <laughs> they also have Bodies, the exhibition. Oh, oh. I've done that before. Have actually, you? Is it cool? I actually did that that exhibit in Vegas when we were out there for Lumos, the Harry Potter convention in like 2006. (laughs) I'm looking at their page. I'm not seeing like, I love that you did that during a con. (laughs) Yeah. It's just like further proof that we did not go to any panels. Yeah, no, definitely didn't. (laughs) I was there at a party. It doesn't look like (laughs) you you can get married at the bodies exhibit. So that's too too bad. bad. (laughs) I mean, listen, if you haven't, if you've got billionaire money, I bet they let you get married wherever you want. True. Not that I have that, but just, (laughs) just saying (laughs) money talks. All right. Well, this has been a great episode of the show, (laughs) but we're going to have more fun today when it comes to these subjects, because Laura, what are we talking about in After Dark today? Well, we figured what better time to talk about Titanic conspiracies than this week. Um, So we're going to be talking about some of the very prominent Titanic conspiracy theories that have been around for a while, but had, interestingly enough, started, you know, sort of garnering some more steam 
in the period of time leading up to this Titan disaster, a lot of Titanic conspiracy theories had bubbled up to the surface again, right before all this Titan shit happened. And then, of course, came the Titan conspiracy theories, which we're going to talk about as well. And maybe even some other conspiracy theories we have. We'll see. We'll see what, what, how we're doing on time. But okay, it should be fun. Yeah, we'll be. Patreon.com slash millennial is where you can go to support our Titanic wedding <laughs> and, and more Titanic talk. Don't forget, we have seven day free trials now, too. So you can hop in and easily sample our content free for seven days. You can also pledge for a year up front and we'll give you a little discount for committing to a year. We also have the new executive producer tier where you can get inside access to two of our planning meetings per month. And you can, you can listen to them live on Fridays or listen to them on Patreon after the fact. They're a good 30, 60 minutes. So there's a lot of extra bonus content right there within the planning meetings. So once again, patreon.com slash millennial. And then if you want to support us on Apple Podcasts, just tap into the show. And same deal. There's a trial available. There's an, there's an annual subscription available. And when you pledge there, you get Mega Millennial, which is millennial ad-free with After Dark at the end. No matter how you support us, we really appreciate your support. And now it's time for some recommendations. Um, well, because I'm going to stay on theme uh, throughout the entirety of this episode, my recommendation does have to do with Titanic. <laughs> um, I'm going to recommend watching the National National Geographic documentary, Titanic's Final Mystery on Paramount+. Plus. Um, this is a documentary that came out several years ago, but what it is positing is that there were some very specific weather and atmospheric conditions the night of the sinking of the Titanic that explain why the crew didn't spot the iceberg until the very last second before they hit it. It's a really fascinating hypothesis, and I learned a lot from watching it. So definitely recommend checking it out. I wanted to recommend the book Funny You Should Ask by Elisa Sussman. If you're looking for a good beach read since it is summertime, this is um, a good option for you. It's a really quick read too. Also, added bonus, if you're a fan of Chris Evans, uh, this is definitely the book for you because this was inspired by this GQ profile that went viral back in like 2010, right before the first Captain America movie came out. Um, the writer spent like a whole weekend with him profiling just like his life. And there was a lot of rumors around this time over whether like anything did or didn't happen between the writer and Chris. And so the author of this book basically like took the idea of that and ran with it. So if you're a fan of like second chance romances or celebrity romances, then like this is the book for you. And I highly would recommend checking it out. And I want to recommend the TV show The Bear on Hulu. This is a I drama. Love this one. Oh, it's so good. Season two yeah. is really good, right? Yes. Season season one was good, really good, but season two is great. It's a whole different vibe. Season one was also very stressful. <laughs> season two is less stressful, though it definitely has its anxiety inducing moments. Um, it's a show about managing and opening a restaurant. Great cast set in Chicago. Excellent characters. Check out The Bear on Hulu. Now it's probably a good time to subscribe to Hulu because I know Only Murders in the Building is coming back for its next season as well very soon. So check it out. Make sure you're following the show in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode and leave us a review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you have any feedback, you can write to millennialshow at gmail.com or you can use the contact form or anonymous confessional on millennialshow.com and follow us on social media. We're Millennial Show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And over on TikTok, we are Millennial Pod. Thanks everybody for listening. After Dark, we'll start in a moment for patrons and Apple Podcast subscribers. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.